babe, are you listening? As soon as you call, I go through the drawers, babe. All I wanna do is get high with you. Hey everyone, welcome to the newest episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. Today's guest joins me from Los Angeles, California. He's an R&B soul singer-songwriter who's got a debut album under his belt that came out in 2019 that's called Phases. He's got a new single out right now called Listenin' on Spotify, Apple Music, and wherever you listen to your songs. And we are extremely excited to have him on the podcast today. Reggie Becton, how are you doing? Sorry about the delay. It's been a crazy day. No, man, you're good. Uh, It was perfect, actually, because like 10 minutes before it was supposed to happen, my light uh, went out, like the only light I use. I was like, oh shit. Oh, so crazy. I, I had to run and go grab uh, another couple of lights at Target. It worked out seriously that you, uh, you had to reschedule for a second. All right, yeah, so I think this will be a lot better. Yeah, that looks great, man. Appreciate you, nice shirt, Crev for Cuba. Yeah, hey, shout out to Crev. I always gotta- <laughs> Right now. Yeah, gotta stand up, show it for the camera here. Please show it. Yeah, man. Krev is the man. That's how I basically even know about you. Oh, thank you, man. He just talked highly about you as well. Uh, hey, Krev is literally one of my favorite people. And I think everybody who's ever met him thinks the same thing. No, for sure. He's like one of the greatest people I've come across here in L.A. Yeah. For those who don't know, Krev uh, is a friend of mine, friend of yours, who uh, owns a fashion label. Krev for Cuba. Everybody needs to go check him out. I'm giving him the plug right now. Yes, please. He designed my merch, too, for my home tour. So, Yeah, man. I wanted to ask you about that. What was your experience like doing your first... Was it your first merch line? Yeah, it was the first... It was. It, we did some merch before, but this was the first merch that um, we actually, like... I, like, worked with a designer on and conceptualized the ideas and things like that. And it was, it was kind of fun to do because we had a budget. And, like, Krev... One thing about Krev, Krev is great in working in budgets and making, like inexpensive thing looked the coolest so we came up with the idea to have these like home hoodies and letters and like literally me and Krev I was cutting the letters and he was sewing and it was the night before I left for tour so it literally was like down to the wire the night I left before tour we like sewing like 20 hoodies we took 20 hoodies on the road with us and we sewed out of all of them but yeah we were sewing them tonight the night before everything so we did it so crazy Damn, you guys are like ultimate DIY, doing it right before the show. Ultimate DIY was crazy. What was what did you learn making your own clothes when you went into it? Did you have an idea of like you knew exactly what you wanted, or did things kind of shift as you started talking to him about like, oh, well, it might not look good with this kind of material or whatever? No, so there was definitely some things that shifted, like material and stuff, like different textiles and fabrics. He really knew like the ins and out of that and which would be like the best thing to go with. But for the most part, the design stayed the same throughout the con- conceptually stayed the same throughout the entire thing. And it was cool to do because I felt like it was something that like I didn't normally, you know, you make a T-shirt, you send it to like a print company and they just print it or you do like Photoshop. This was something where like it was hand stitching involved, cutting out fabric, you know, and each one is to me, each one of the home hoodies are like a one of one, you know. Mm-hmm. And it kind of stemmed from this idea from my listening party. Krev brought me a home crew neck. I don't even, I can't even remember why he put home on it. Maybe he knew about the tour. Maybe that by that time the tour was already announced. But he bought me a home crew neck. And I was like, yo, these would be perfect to make, like, mass produce more of these for the tour. And he was like, yo, I'm with it. Let's do it. And we both got to make some money off some merch. So that was great there's something so much more special about actually doing like making it yourself instead of sending it off for someone to get made. And and that's, you know, totally fine too. But when the fans themselves can brag about the fact that like, Oh yeah, they made it themselves. This is a one of one creates that bond with the the fans you like might not have. Yeah. I think that like the home hoodies are going to be something we look back on like two years or three years from now, where it's like people are going to be like, yo, I wish I was around to get those hoodies during that time and things like that. Like the whole team has one. Um, so yeah, it's just like um, fun to like see it, like see it around and see how like we all gravitate for it. We take pride in like wearing our home hoodies. It's like a collectible. Yeah, it's like a collectible item now. So I got to ask you about your newest single, which came out a couple weeks ago. It's called Listening. Yes. And I fucking love it, dude. It's a great song. How Thank does it feel you. to have it out? 
it feels really good to have it out. You know, um, it's weird because we had a lot of things planned for this year, you know, the pandemic messed up and listening was one of the things that weren't planned at all. And it just came organically one night when I was working on some stuff, trying to like work on a collaboration with a friend of mine who's an artist. And she heard the beat and she was just like, yeah, like that beat is crazy. We should do something to that. So after that, I was like, all right, let me try to put together like a reference or some type of idea of a song, some type of skeleton. And then like, I, once I did it, once I did the first verse and the hook, I had texted to my manager a video recording of it. And they were like, oh, this shit is crazy. Like, this sounds too good. Like, you need to finish this. I was like, all right. And I finished it all of that night. I finally finished it about like three hours tops. Damn. When was this? This was maybe end of July. Oh, wow. So you work fast. <laughs> yeah, I recorded it, sent it straight to my mixing engineer, shout out Jeff Jackson. And um, that's like, it was like, uh, it closed it after that, you know, like, it was just easy to do. It's so easy to do. And I'm super happy with their um, responses getting. Because even leading up to it, I was like, I don't really know about this one, you know, like, I don't know, it was something about it that I just did. not like, when I first did it, I loved it. And then by the time we got it through mixing and mastering, it was time to come out. I was like, mm, I don't know about it. I don't know if this is gonna be the one. And I, I uploaded a snippet of it um, before we released it. And it was like the most like engaged snippet that I've ever released of a song. So I was like, okay, that must be a sign. And then now we're here and it's doing great. So I'm just happy about it. Can't complain at all. It's a great song. And what you were just saying about having a hard time deciding like towards the end, oh man, like, is this it? Is this the one? I was looking at your discography and this is your first single in over a year. And I'd imagine that you've got, you know, songs in the vault. What made you pick this one as the first after not only a year, but after your debut album, which is kind of like a milestone in itself. I just felt like when I recorded it, it, it gave me a feeling, you know, like I record a lot of music and you record a lot of songs and some stuff is like, some stuff gives you a feeling like, yo, this is, this is going to be on my project. Like I need to save this because this needs to be a part of your project. And there's some stuff you record and you're like, I just need to put this out right now. Like I just have to put this out right now. And that was more of the feeling for this one because it was just like so good. Like the sound of it was current and to me it had like a little up up a more upbeat sound which is normally something i don't really go towards to or lean towards into yeah it was just like and everyone loved it when i sent it to everybody on the team it was just like yo this is crazy let's do it like everyone was just like this need to the world needs to hear this now so i just thought it was perfect timing like a perfect summer singer to just stand alone because the project i'm working on now doesn't sound like that at all so it's just like a good like a good just standalone like song to go Today's a crazy day because we're working on like the prep for the video shoot for listening. And we're also working on prep for a show that I just, that I have for California State University. So it's a bit just like a lot of moving parts and I still work a nine to five. So it's just a crazy life to live right now. But yeah, so, um, but yeah, just super proud that listening is out and that people are starting to hear it and they're really liking it and they're sharing it. And I just hope it continues to like grow. How do you manage working a nine to five job and making music like this all the time? Um, it's it's tough. Like it's really tough. Um, I feel like when I um I feel like it kind of gets really easy because like sometimes my nine to five is a bit quieter, so I don't have to give as much to it. But this last like two to three months have just been a constant need. Let me turn this off. A constant need for me at my job, and um, it it's been a trying time, and. I don't, it's like one of the things where like, sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to be able to leave this job and like do music full time. But literally without this job, I wouldn't be able to like develop half of the content I create because the job pays for all, like allows me to like invest and create all this content and things like that. So it's like a double-edged sword, but I think part of balancing is like kind of like trying to set my schedule and like working at different hours. So sometimes I'm working at my nine to five at 4 a.m. in the morning to get a head start of the day. So I'm like four to 10 a.m. I'm working on my nine to five just so I can have like 10 to like three or something to do my music. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's crazy. That's dedication. What kind of advice would you give in terms of investing in your music? Because I mean, I know a lot of people who do have maybe a bedroom set up. That's what I got. But what would you recommend people to invest in and what would you say don't worry about that that's not worth it i would say like definitely like listening was recorded on my bedroom equipment you know and my bedroom equipment is not top notch but it's like it's 
it's industry standard in a way, you know. So like a mic that's like very good for bad bedroom is like an SM7B. I would definitely recommend that to anybody. And it's like a five or six hundred dollar mic. And then I would say get a good like mixer, like a UA audio or something. That's what I use. And it's like that's about seven to eight hundred dollars. And right there you have industry standard, and then all you need is a mic going directly straight into it. And your I mean your mic line, you put your mic line directly straight into it. Maybe you can like record guitar, you can like record bass, you can record a lot of things on the UA audio along with videos. I would say invest in a mixing engineer. So something I do is I outsource my mixing. So I'll do like a reference mix to show the person I'm sending it to, um, what how like how I want the record to be sound, and then they take it and like make it even more industry standard. So that's something I would say. Um, mastering, like invest in mastering. Thing that I would say doesn't don't invest in too much. Um, don't don't go crazy on video shoots. Like the amount of money you put into video shoots, like you can make a lot of great stuff on a cheap budget and just find people who are hungry and who want to build their portfolio as well. I work with a lot of people who are like, I'm grateful to have because a lot of them are just passionate about their career. So it's, that's, it's not a big um, overhead cost when I shoot a video or something because I have a lot of industry contacts that I know that are just like passionate and want to build with artists. So find people like that. Um, I would say don't put too much into like trying to impress people by like a look. I would say invest more into like your sound, invest more into working with the right producers, you know, like um, compensate your producers, compensate when you can, like compensate them what you can. Like everyone is fine with like, sometimes all people want is gas money to get to and back from the studio or to and back from a video shoot. So sometimes just always be aware. And also like when you get those opportunities to make money or do something, or when you have a little bit extra, do something nice for the people who've been looking out for you and helping you create your content because it's, it's very important to make people feel appreciated, especially when you're not able to compensate them for their work or their value. Yeah, I always talk about community on this podcast and how important it is to reach out to people and become friends with people who are doing the same thing as you or maybe not exactly the same, but something else to do with the arts so that you can collaborate in ways that, you know, two, two heads are better than one. And you'll make up something, make something cooler. And, you know, you probably won't have to pay for it because you guys are just friends and you're doing it for the love of it. Right. And that's kind of even like that's kind of how like the um, merch with me and Kraft, where it was like, hey, you're designing these hoodies and you're going to be selling them. How can I compensate you? Like, I don't have the money right now to compensate you, but let, let me take care of all the materials we need. I'll cover those expenses. And when we sell any hoodie, then we'll just split it 50 50. You know what I'm saying? And Kraft was Kerv only wanted 20%, you know what I'm saying? Or he didn't want nothing at all. And I'm like, no, you have to get something. Like, it's just not fair. You know what I'm saying? He's like, well, you pay for everything. I'm like, no, you're you're using your time. This is your expertise. This is your skill. This is your talent. This is your gift. I need to compensate you for something like that, you know? So it's just little things like that, like trying to like always like right the wrong. And it's not wrong that you can't compensate somebody, but trying to right the fact that you, you know what I'm saying? Just trying to balance that out, making sure like everybody is able to eat off something. Yeah, it's good to give back because at some point, you're going to be in a place where you're like, uh, like, I wish I could use this or I wish I could do that. And somebody will come and help you along and you'll be so grateful that they did. Yeah. And it's like on top of that, like giving back for that reason, but also just like putting good energy out in the world. And like one thing I try to abide by in this industry that I always tell my manager, like when we work with people and we collaborate with people, like it's always my guiding principle is like, yo, I want to treat people how I would like to be treated. So I've been in situations where someone has like not treated me how I would have expected them to or not did something the way I would hope they had done it. And a lot of people internalize that and then they do it on to others instead of like correcting the wrong how they treat somebody else. So just little things like that with like working with other artists. Like if I'm going to get an artist to open for me, I'm going to make sure I give them a, a great, like, you know what I'm saying? Give them a great time slot and give them a long enough set, you know, and make sure they have all the things they need. You know what I'm saying? Just so because this is what the things I would like to be afforded when I open for somebody. This is how comfortable I would be. So just small little things like that go a long way. When you are looking at other people to be collaborators or someone who's opening for you, what are you looking for in those people? Um, I think it's always, for me, it starts with just like a mutual respect for each other. If I see you like making strides and making moves in the industry, it's, you already have my respect because it's so fucking hard to like create hedgeway and create a name in the industry and create a buzz. It's so fucking hard. So anybody that I deem or like I see out of, I'm, that has garnered my attention and my, and like, I'm like, okay, this person is like doing cool shit. They're fucking it up. 
I'm like that mutual respect is there first. And then after that, it's like good music, having great music, music that I like, or even great talent. Like not everybody that I work with, I'm a fan of maybe every song they have, but I might be a true fan of their voice or a true fan of their like rap ability and things like that. So it's different things that you can be a fan of that will make you want to work with somebody. And I think that like having a mutual respect and having a love for someone's talent or music is like those first guiding principles. And I think the last one is just like chemistry. Like, can we get in the studio and can we vibe? Like, you know, and I've done like a lot of collaborations this year and it's been fun to do because it's been like each one has told me a little bit different and like has been a different style in the music. But there's also been times where collaborating with people were like, I went in it thinking it would be a friendship and sometimes it's just business and that's okay too. And once you learn that, you're kind of, you, once you like learn that, at first you're taking it back forward if you're that type of person. I thought when I did all these features, everybody I work with, we would start building a relationship. We would text every other week, you know, like we would, we would just be friends. Like, and that's not how it works. And it's nothing wrong with that at all, but you just gotta like get used to like, that's not how it work. And I think part of that is because working on music is so like vulnerable and personal. So you feel like you like bear your soul with somebody in the studio creating this project. So you think after you do that, like you guys are kind of like connected to a sense. And it's just not like that. And it's, and it's super fun and it's not that way. It's not a bad thing. You just got to get used to it. That's interesting. I wonder if part of it is because if it's people who've been doing it for so long, maybe they feel like they don't want to uh, just open up with every person they're doing a feature right. with. So in that sense, it's not personal, but it's exactly. great that you already have the mindset of you're creating when you're working with someone or you're meeting somebody, you're going to create this positive space where they can feel comfortable uh, doing, giving their best performance. Cause that's really what you should be doing. You should be making people feel comfortable in your environment when you're working on your music or their music or, you know, such and such. Exactly. So I do want to ask you about phases because I think it's just really cool that you've you have been working on your music for a good while and I guess two years into releasing your first project or I guess maybe about a year then you release your debut album was there anything different when you went into that that you had to like correct your mind for like were there certain pressures that came along with it being a debut album yeah, so like my being is orange is not necessarily my debut album. Um, to me, it's like another it's like another page in the story. Yeah, I, I was thinking of phases. Sorry. Oh yeah, so that's like my day introduction to the world. It's what I call like my debut EP. And just because how length is short, they won't call it an album because how short it is or whatever. And I think that working on that was working on that was a bit. Um, I want to say working on that was a bit refreshing because I felt like I had put like out this mixtape before that and it was received well. So I was able to go back in the studio and like learn from what I did and do all the things that I didn't like about that mixtape and really like kind of like create something that was more of a, a company or embodiment of who I am or who I was at that time and where I was musically. And I think it just allowed me to, you know, like do this like alternative R&B and like play around with sound and like, it really taught me about like using my voice as an instrument and like trying to like sing with the beat and not against it. And like, just trying to like mesh with everything that's going on. So that was a cool, super cool project to make. And it was also a project where like, I still was in this like, trying to like grind mode. And like, I, have, I didn't have like producers, go-to producers I could go to when making that project. I didn't have like the top-notch studio gear. Like I didn't have any other studio gear I have now. So it was like really all on like, like some of the vocals that's in some of the songs are like recorded on the iPhone, on the iPhone headset. And um, it was cool and fun to do different things like that because it was like after I watched Steve Lacey's TED talk and it was like doing about the bare, bare maximum or something, I think. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, the TED talk. And it was just like using what you have to like, using what you currently have to like get shit done. So I was just like, yo, I'm gonna use this my knowledge that I have from about everything about recording and techniques I'm going to use the gear and the plugins I have to the best of my ability and I'm going to make a project and that's what I did and it like you know it was just a start of everything it, it kicked everything off for me so when you're starting to write a song how does that start for you what does that process look like it varies a lot lately it's been a lot of like I lately the new project I'm working on I've written everything like down on pen and paper 
with pen and paper. So that's been fun to do. Normally I like use iPhone notes like most artists and things like that. So it's been fun to like do pen and paper and like just like allow myself to like just write what I feel and then scratch out and then write some more what I feel and then scratch out like it just makes you feel like a bit more powerful and a bit more conscious of like what I, it's not just a type you know what I'm saying yeah a little more connected yeah it's a little bit more connected and I also get to like refer back on the things that I might scratch out because I can kind of still see it through the scratch outs and sometimes when you just delete something it's gone forever so that's been fun um but like another way I've been writing is like sometimes I just like pick up the microphone I have in my room and I just put the beat on and I like just like walk around as if I'm on a stage and like see what comes naturally to me like what if I was performing to this beat what would I like what would the energy be and that's been fun as well like that's writing songs like that is always fun because I thought you get out this organic type of song that just comes and it's really fun you're like conjuring this spirit to like tell you what to say or what to exactly that's so funny that's I mean you got to do what you got to do to get in that zone man so I do want to ask you also about Jam in the Van. I think that's a really sick uh, YouTube concert series. And your performance was awesome. Thank you. What do you do? Yeah, of course. What do you do when you're preparing for live shows in general? Like, what does your, your week look like before the show? For that show, it was different. But normally when I'm doing a show, I'm in like full-fledged like show mode. So that's like dieting, not eating dairy, not drinking soda, like all that type of shit taking care of yourself yeah taking care of my voice like steaming it once a day um and doing like vocal lessons and also doing rehearsals on top of those like when we were preparing for tour we we probably prepared for tour like for four months practicing every weekend to like 4 a.m and then as we got closer we probably started doing like four times a week to like 3 a.m and i thank god for my band because like i said like earlier like i don't have the biggest budget to compensate them about their value and things like that and they are all troopers brett Dev, Marco, um, and Jam the Van, Rohan and Dre joining me, joined me. And they're all troopers, like all like just great people who's like, all right, bro, we believe in you, we believe in the sound, like we'll we'll do you this solid one, you know? So um that's been fun. But for Jam and the Van, it was different because we literally maybe got an email Tuesday, the taping was thir- we probably got an email Monday, the taping was Thursday. So it was like three days to turn it around and um my normal band wasn't available, so that's like Marco. He wasn't available, so we. This is my first show performing with like Rohan and Dev, not Dev, Rohan and um Dre. So we literally rehearsed. We they rehearsed like me one day, then I came in for rehearsal the night before. We rehearsed like for an hour because that's how much time we had, and then the next day we showed up at Jam in the Van, and it was just like all right, we're going to see what we're going to do. And I was so nervous, like, because part of my, like, nervousness on stage comes from not feeling, like, ready or not feeling rehearsed enough. Like, try to over-rehearse. And uh, um, we knocked it out, but I was so fucking nervous. And because I watched Jammin' and Fan, and I'm such a fan of the platform, and such a, like, I know the weight it holds and, like, how many greats have came and, like, grace the stage of people who are up next came. I was just so nervous, and... I forgot the fucking words to rain in LA and I was like singing. I've been singing that song for like a fucking year. I didn't even notice, man. Um, yeah, so it was just like so like nerve wracking and different things like that. But all in all, it turned out great. Shout out to the Ramon Van and QSC for having me. And it was a great experience and I really enjoyed it. And like you said, like a lot of people like those videos from that and I love them as well. I'm super proud of how those came out. So all in all, I'm happy with it, but I was hella fucking nervous. I didn't even notice that you were nervous, man. You had such a great energy on stage. That's such a hard thing to do, especially, I can't believe you only had basically two, three days to practice and you only practiced the night before, actually. Right, exactly. And I think like all these things like happen when like these small little things happen, I look at it as like God telling me like, you have to do this to like prepare. Cause like, if I told like, when we, when me and my manager Megan was discussing even taking it on, I was like, yo, let's do it because one day, It'll be we're on tour and the BET Awards will call, the VMAs will call and say, hey, can you perform it this year? And we're like, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. we have these things that we didn't expect this. And it may be a small window to like make it happen, but that's what you do when it's like a great opportunity. Yeah, it really teaches you to prepare way, way ahead of time and for things you don't even know could happen. It's just be prepared for anything, literally. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, I want to take us over to the last five where I'm just going to ask you five quick questions and then we'll be out of here. Okay, cool. 
All right, man. Question number one. Who's your dream producer to work with? Rodney Jerkins. Rodney Jenkins? Jerkins. He's like Jerkins. the man who produced like all the, like a lot of Brandy's music. And I okay. Just, the music so I would love to work with Rodney Jerkins. Rodney Jerkins. I have not heard of him, but I'll have to check him out. Is there a project I should look for? So if you listen to Brandy's Full Moon album, that's like a great project and he produced most of it. And it's just so great. Okay, six. A big hit song, Rowdy Jerkins. He did um, Her's Heart Place. He produced that. Okay. Okay, dope. That's sick. Is he based in LA? I don't know. I'm not sure. I know he's, I think he, I believe he's from Atlanta, but he's like a legend, like somebody on Timberland's level. He's like up wow. there. Wow. Damn. All right. I feel like I'm under a rock. I'll have to check him out. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you some stuff. I'll send you some stuff. I'll send you some stuff. Yeah, please do. Roger Jerkins and New Moon by, what was, who's it? Full Moon, Full Moon by Brandy, and it's Rodney Jerkins produced it. Full Moon by Brandy. All right, sick, man. All right, question two. In the studio or playing live? Which one do you like more? Ooh, that's a, such a hard one. Yeah. Damn, that's a hard one. Um, I'm going to go with in the studio because we've been working on a new project. I haven't been able to perform live, so I kind of forgot the feeling. Right. In the studio right now, we're working on a new project, and it's like been such like a different experience creating this one. Because like we're in like a real professional studio this time around, and it's like I'm a we're able to create on the spot, and like all my producers are like in one place, and we're all like creating. So that's just been really fun to fucking do. So right now in the studio has been my favorite. I love the studio because it feels like you're cr like creating something or summoning something that doesn't exist yet. Exactly. And live is also great, of course. You get that rush, like those nerves, like, and it's a week long event almost. Like, you have to prepare for it for a week, but you know, to each his own. All right, man. Question three Who is the most underrated artist to you right now? Um, I'm going to go with PJ Morton. PJ Morton is the keyboardist from Maroon 5, and he makes music on his side. Oh, no way. And I think that he should be like, way bigger than what he is and he just makes phenomenal music he plays the keys he's a piano player and it's just like so fucking great so i'm gonna go with pj morgan that's sick i was not expecting a uh, a maroon 5 shout out there yeah he should be he should be like as big as john legend to be honest like that's how big he should be that's how great he is damn pj morton is there a song or an album he's got out that we should check out to, like gumbo live gumbo live it's a live album he has the studio one but gumbo live is like the one that I found when I, I found him a long time ago when he had following my first mind. But then like when I rediscovered him, it was Gumbo Live. Interesting. Gotcha. Gumbo Live. Who would be an unexpected influence for you? Somebody who maybe your fans would be surprised to learn that you're really in love with. I really love Bon Jovi. What? Yeah. We love Bon Jovi, the lead singer is phenomenal, and I just love his voice and the rapping and Bruce Springsteen too. Those two people, dude, like they when it comes to like rock music and like when anytime I get to add some like rock influence to something, like that is so funny, man. My parents are gonna lose it. They love Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen is my is my dad's absolute favorite artist of all he's time. Fucking phenomenal. I I found out about Bruce Springsteen when I watched like the Dr. Dre document, Jimmy Iovine, the Dr. Dre documentary. Oh yeah, yeah. Was it the great ones or the yeah, awesome ones or something? I can't remember what it was. What it yeah, was, I can't remember. But it was fucking phenomenal, and I like downloaded Mad Bruce Springsteen. Something in the night is fucking crazy. Something in the night, man. That is such a great song. I, that's so hype that you said Bruce and Bon Jovi. They love Bon Jovi too. Living on a Prayer will never die. That's a great song. Oh my gosh, that's my favorite Bon Jovi song. <laughs> All right, man. I'm gonna send you out on this last question here. If you couldn't wear an orange beanie, what would your second hat be? Right now, I have this bandana that I'm really been feeling. That I rock. It's like a black bandana. Okay. So the bandana will be the second. Will be the second like runner up to the orange beanie. It's crazy because this is like my first interview in probably like three years without an orange beanie. I was wondering if you were going to wear it. I was putting I'm money. I'm back then today. Um, I don't have it on me. I've been running so much. Sorry about that. Hey, that's all good, man. This is just another side of you. That's all. Yeah, this is another side. Sick. All right, Reggie Becton, man, I think we're all done here. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad we got to meet, and uh, hopefully I get to see you soon, hang out with Krev or something. Sure, we got to link up, you know? Absolutely, bro. Well, the world comes down, we'll get to catch up, you know? Yeah, dude, I hope so. 
Well, I'll let you go get back to your uh, your work in here right now. Thank you for having me, and thanks for having this great platform, you know, and, like, supporting independent artists and just giving us a place to share our story. It means a lot. I know that, like, it's hard making a platform and, like, trying to build something from the ground up, but you got to keep going because voices like yours are needed. So thank you, man. Oh, man. Seriously, I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. I have a lot of fun doing this, and I'm really excited that people like you want to join in and listen. Oh, it's sure. awesome. Anytime. Like, anytime we can talk about something. I'm right on, man. Well, I appreciate you. I'll let you go, and I'll, I'll talk to you later soon. All right, cool. Have a great one. See you, dude. Bye. Bye. Yeah. And maybe try me. Uh -huh. Trying to stay patient. Anyway.